Hello and welcome to Art Talks, a series of lectures to help you and your arts organization increase both your funding and your audience size. My name is Dan Brown and we at the Capitol Theatre have been working with support from the Ontario Trillium Foundation to bring you the top local experts in their field to leave you with actionable insights, takeaways and lessons that you can implement today. So fundraising in Canada is actually a very big industry. It's, there's 86,000 charities in Canada, and I think a lot of people are surprised to know it's that many. And uh, just over 5,000 of those are in the arts sector. And uh, so that represents 6.2% of charities in Canada, with 2.87 billion in total revenue from all fun for fundraising from all sectors and 689 million in fundraising revenue. And the average fundraising revenue for an arts organization is $135,000. So as you can see, we're talking about a lot of organizations, a lot of money that's generated through fundraising, including grants. So before you want to write a grant, you want to make sure that you have certain things in place. You don't want to just say, you know, look it up on the internet and say, oh, I'm gonna, um, submit my application to the Rogers Foundation. You want to make sure that you have certain things in place. First off being your budget. You want to know what your expenses are, your income, all of that data. You want to make sure you have your nonprofit charitable tax status. Um, a database is really important to know who you're asking money for, how much you received, who you submitted to, who said yes, who said no. I mean, I can't stress the importance of having good data. Um, a system to acknowledge your donors, so that, like I said, include your receiving, your thank you letters, your newsletters. Um, individuals, so you have to have either staff, a board of directors, volunteers, to ask for the money. Um, it's hard to do it on your own, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, and then knowledge of available funding sources. So how do you currently raise money and what are your future plans? So in some instances that you might be very small and have an art exhibit and you charge ticket sales and it's very volunteer driven. And then you could look at something as sophisticated as the Toronto International Film Festival, which has hundreds of employees, hundreds of volunteers, and is a multi-million dollar machine in in essence. And you want to know have the basic materials about your organization. So, you know, I think a website at bare minimum, or at least having some kind of social media presence, um, some documents that you can talk about your organization and develop your uh, case for support. What is it you're funding and why should anyone care? I mean, these are crucial, crucial questions that you need to ask yourself before you can even think about going to a grant uh, organization. So, you know, further to that firm knowledge of who you are and what you're hoping to achieve. And, and again, clarity and agreement about how the funds are going to be used. So, increasingly, donors are very sophisticated and want to know how their money is going to be used, and that includes grantees, and transparency. And Increasingly, people are directing their funds to a specific cause or events or sponsorship or, or what have you. It's nice when someone gives you a check for 100000 and says use it as you'd like and, you know, we don't want to hear from you again. That is so, so not the case increasingly. They want to know how you're going to use it. They want reporting. They want, you know, ongoing communication. So we'll talk about that a little bit later too. But just know that writing the grant and reaching out is the first step in a long process and think about it as a, like a lifelong relationship. Um, and like I said, they want accountability and transparency. So grants, there are lots of opportunities and you're going to see in a moment some stats that, uh, that back that up. Um, so there's every, you know, there's grants at the local level, there's grants at the provincial level, at the national level, and in some inst instances at the international level. 
And grant organizations can be family foundations, they can be corporate foundations, they can be community foundations. There's a whole um, lot of opportunity and potential. But again, you need to know your organization and what it is you're funding. And you really, I can't stress enough how much you have to have clarity around that. Because grants, um, when they ask you questions, they'll ask them in different ways. And they really want you to nail down and be able to answer specific questions. Increasingly, that's been my experience. And who's your audience? Um, you know, it's much different if you're running a music festival than it is if you're running an art exhibit or a hospital foundation versus um, education. They all have very different audiences that might be interested in your cause that you can tap into. So next I'm just giving you a snapshot. So this statistic is um, from 2013 out of uh, Giving USA, but I, I know that the, the statistics are very similar when it comes to Canada. So 72% of your giving comes through individuals, 7% um, from bequests, 15% from foundations, and 6% from corporations. So you can see individuals are the largest sector, followed then by foundations. So cor corporations, a lot of people you know, will sit here and, and think that they're your best bet to go to for, for funding or sponsorship. And I can tell you as well that I would rather approach a small grant organization or an individual or a family foundation because the turnaround time is much quicker, the opportunity to establish a relationship is better, and you just it's, it's just more efficient and you can develop a relationship rather than feel like you're going into this black hole and you never hear from, from them again. So although there's a lot of opportunity, um, we've seen some numbers that, that showcase that, both in terms of the amount of funds that are donated um, in Canada and the United States, but there, it's very competitive. And I think um, we see this all over the place, but I know I've worked at four or five work organizations in Windsor, and um, there's 10 names that have been on my prospect list whether I was at the University of Windsor, whether I was at Windsor Regional Hospital, or now I'm at the Canadian Mental Health Association. And, you know, it's a small community in that sense. So it's really important to know your brand. Who are you and what are you hoping to achieve? And develop your case for support. So this is so vital. And it's whether you're asking an individual or um, a foundation for money, when you're, when you're applying for a grant, they're gonna wanna know who you are, what are you doing, and you know why should we care? Why should we support you when I get you know, 30 other applications? And it, you, know, you really have to nail down that case for support, spend a lot of time on it, get other people to read it, and, um, and give you feedback. Because you might think, oh, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me, but having your peers or your colleagues um, read it over is, is very uh, important. And then, you know, you're going to look at your competitors. So who are they? And what are they doing? And how are you different? Um, and But how are you similar? And increasingly, what I've seen as well when it comes to uh, foundations and getting grants is they love collaborations. Like I said, there's a lot of competition for money. And if you can show that by coming together with, you know, the Arts Council and BookFest and, you know, the Film Festival, and you're going to work collaborative, collaboratively to build this great event or, or exhibit, they love that because you're building on each other's strengths and the money can, you know, make a further impact. And really that's, when it comes to a grant, you really want to show impact, how they are going to improve the lives of others in the community or you know the environment or find a piece of equipment that's going to better the lives of others so it's impact 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 and um, being responsible with the money they're giving you 
So again, know your strengths that are relative to who your competitors are and your weaknesses because like I said, you might be able to build on the strength of your competitors to come together and do something really unique and exciting. And, um, and I've seen firsthand that by collaborating, collaborating with others, um, it can be very successful. So how to get started? Like we've said, so there's all this wealth of opportunity out there. Where am I going to look? So um, a lot of organizations, especially in the arts, um, to government grants to the Arts Council, for example. Um, and then there's some other very popular ones. So Trillium. Trillium um, was generous enough to fund the Art Talks. So um, they're very prevalent. And um, they have become uh, quite sophisticated in both in terms of their application process, which is all done online and um, the way they structure their grants. So they just went through an overhaul. You can go on their website and see, but I mean, they do everything from like a seed grant um, for some new idea you want to develop to something much larger and you're asking for, um, you know, close to a million dollars. Imagine Canada is a great resource, both in terms of information about the nonprofit sector as well as checking out some grant opportunities. Um, there is a fee to use their grant seeker um, database, but again, collaboration. You might know someone that has that um, program that would be kind enough to uh, allow you to use it for an hour or something to do some, some quick searches. Um, foundation search is uh, another vehicle. Again, there's a cost associated with that, but you might uh, be able to find someone, to, um, another organization that will allow you to use that for, um, to do some research. And also just looking at what's available in your community. So, you know, a lot of cities have community foundations. So we do in Windsor have the Windsor Essex Community Foundation, um, as well as, um, you know, there's some well-known families that have foundations, so you can check them out um, as well. I've also found that um, annual reports from other organizations are a wealth of information. So I know I'll always look at the United Way. So they raise, you know, on average $5 million a year, and I'll go through and I'll say, okay, what foundations are, you know, are they getting funds from? And then it might tweak something that, oh yeah, I forgot about them. And then go online, you know, see what you can find. Do they have a Facebook page? What are they funding? Um, you know, using the tools that are at your disposal that are free of charge. Like I said, online research, um, community and foundation listservs, list and who's funding some of your competitors or your partners. Um, check that out. And I always thought that arts organizations um, had this great advantage when it came to research because they produce programs often, right? If you've gone to see a play or a concert or, you know, you've seen the symphony or the film festival. And I'm always like looking through who, you know, who are their sponsors? Who's, who, um, you know, funded this or funded that? So, you know, those are a wealth of information. The other one that I, I didn't list in the presentation, but if you go to the KCI website, so that's Ketchum Canada, they are um, probably the largest fundraising consultants, consulting company in Canada. And they, right on their homepage, they have this scroll going through showing these, like, uh, transformational gifts that foundations or individuals have given to various organizations across the country. Um, because increasingly, um, you know, it used to be 10 years ago, if someone gave a million dollars, it was all over the, the front page and got lots of media attention. Well, that bar has risen over the years, so, um, I mean, I think that's exciting and scary at the same time, but, um, you know, if you think big, there are, uh, it shows that anything is possible. So looking to research. So again, using some of those tools and really nailing down what foundations, what their interests are. Uh, you may find someone that loves art galleries, but they only want to fund things in British Columbia. 
So, you know, you have to look around and do your homework and, uh, and find out who's interested in what. And, you know, geography might be a limitation. Um, sometimes it's a specific area. Um, so, so look on that. I also find it useful um, to look at who's on their board of directors um, because they might have a connection to someone in your organization. Windsor is two degrees of separation, so chances are that if they're a local foundation, if you don't recognize someone on their board, someone close to your organization may. And um, grant fundraising is like any other kind of fundraising and it comes down to relationships. And, um, and that's why, going back to what I said, sometimes the smaller ones are so much easier to deal with. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an example. So, um, like I said, I'm part of um, the Canadian Mental Health Association. And hopefully you've seen the Bell Let's Talk campaign. And every year they say they're funding mental health. So, so many people have come up to me and said, that's great, you get all that money from Bell Let's Talk. Like, congratulations, that's phenomenal. And I said, well, you know what, actually, we have not received any money from that program. We apply every year, but um, we have not gotten a grant from them. Uh, when I was at the hospital, similarly, I applied three times, and um, I did get through some red tape and talking to friends of friends or connections. Finally got to speak to someone, and um, I think I just wore them down eventually, and we received a grant, but it was really feeling them out and getting a sense of what specifically they're interested in. Um, I still haven't been successful at that, in that at CMHA, but I will. Um, it just, it's, um, you know, because I know now who I have to talk to and I can kind of further that relationship. And again, I think they just get, get worn down and think, you know what, we better just give her something because we, we will, we'll just keep hearing from her. <laughs> Alternatively, we recently received a grant at CMHA from a local foundation out of London. And the turnaround time was quite short, um, like maybe a couple months, which for a grant is, is pretty remarkable. And what was even nicer is the woman that's part of the foundation drove down to Windsor to give us a check where she could have just put it in the mail. She came, she got to meet some of the people in the program, and then she participated in the program she was funding for the day. So talk about seeing the impact. Um, and you know, we've established a relationship now. She's seen how, what their money is going to be used for. So anytime you can give someone a tour or have those personal introductions, I would encourage it because that um, can, can really work to your advantage. Um, and then as far as research, what's the process? Um, increasingly, um, I'm seeing more and more of the larger foundations, they want a online application. Which, I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages. I, I certainly understand it from Trillium's perspective or the RBC Foundation's perspective because they get so many, they want to streamline it, you know, compare apples to apples. I find it discouraging or um, frustrating because I don't always get to say everything I want to say in that format. Because in Trillium's case, for example, you're limited to so many characters. And it's like, but I got this great data, and I, you know, when I have only 150 words, I can't really make my case. So you really have to be concrete and, and know your case. Um, whereas, you know, I always like to show pictures if I can, and dress it up, and really brand it to my organization so that they can get a look, um, look and feel of what we're about. Um, but you have to use what, what you can and, and you, like again, that just comes back to your case for support and you have to make it solid and uh, you know, you, in fundraising you also you know, sometimes hear, or you may have heard before about the elevator pitch, that this great prospect comes into you know, the elevator with you and you've got two minutes to you know, have exposure to this person, so your case has to be concrete, like hi, I'm with you know, the Arts Council, and uh, we have this really exciting project, and you know, here's my card, can I follow up with you, or 
you know, just saying what the project is in that when you have that opportunity. But, like I said, with online op applications, you don't always have that. But, um, um, you know, you have to use what, what they want. Um, and like I said, try to talk to someone from the foundation to determine their interest. I know I've done that with um, the Trillium Foundation before. They um, had local representatives or someone from their board and, you know, say, this is what I'm thinking, um, you know, what do you think? And that's been very, very helpful um, to pick up the phone and, and try and um, get, through, get through the gatekeepers and, and um, you know, why waste your time in theirs if it's like, you know what, this is not going to fit, we have no interest in this whatsoever. So, again, relationships. So just, you know, so you're prepared. There's common documents that, regardless of the format, you're going to be asked for uh, when applying for a grant. So they want your mission statement, your vision statement, um, the program overview for what you're wanting to fund. Again, your case for support, your budget, uh, a list of board members, that's very common. Um, sometimes some staff, um, people in the program they want to know and uh, your audited financial statements. Those are all, very seldom have I ever applied, ever applied for a grant and not had to provide the majority of that list. So again, you know, take a step back and look at what the funder's priorities are. Because you might think it's a fantastic match and it's the best idea ever, but if it's not on their list, don't waste your time, don't waste their time, and go on to, you know, things that do match better. Um, you know, what are their organizational requirements? And like I said before, their geographic focus. Um, the size of the grant, you know, what is appropriate to ask for? Um, I just uh, had this conversation with the corporation um, a couple months ago for a project. No, I didn't have it directly with the foundation, but I had it with a colleague who I knew had received a grant from this organization, and I said, you know, like, you don't have to tell me specifically, you know, if it's confidential, but, you know, do you think 25000 over five years would be reasonable? You know, we talked about it, and she agreed that, yes, that was um, in the realm of possibility, she believed. But, you know, not having that conversation, I could have said to them, hey, you know, how about 100000 And they would have, you know, that could have scared them off, right? So just just knowing um, who it is you're dealing with and what is within the realm of possibility. Again, the grant that I referred to earlier, I mean, was a smaller family foundation and we asked for $1,000. You know, who knows, if we'd asked for 10000 we probably wouldn't have, have received it. So um, just know what's, what it is appropriate to ask for. Look at other organizations that um, they have funded, like I referred to earlier. The funding timeline. So. Some of them have very strict deadlines, Trillium, for example. Um, others, you know, it, they don't even list it. it. It's just they'll accept them all the time. Some um, organi grantee organizations will say they don't even, um, they're not interested in receiving unsolicited proposals. So they have to come to you. So I've seen that too. Um, and then ask yourself, like, do you have the manpower or the organizational capacity to write the proposal, because it's a lot of work in some instances. Trillium, I mean, I keep coming back to that, but it's because they, they do fund a lot of things, and, and uh, it's, it's a good example, but you could spend hours and hours on that, tweaking, tweaking, and more tweaking. And then, whether you have the capacity to follow the funding requirements, because sometimes they expect A, B, C, like this laundry list, of, um, of things they want you to do with the grant. And if you're a shop of two people, it, you may not be able to carry it out, and then they're not going to be happy with you, and just everything becomes very messy. So, what if you get a yes? Um, the grant's going to cover your operating expenses, you're able to support ex existing activities, or you might be able to expand um, activities in a way that's productive and helps advance your mission. And when you get a no, because inevitably um, there tend to be more no's than yeses, and I would just say do not get discouraged. Um, 
because sometimes they do you a favor. Um, I know in some insta instances I've looked at some grant organizations and um, they might be doing great things, but I'm thinking, okay, they don't want to find really what I'm looking for, and that's going to create this whole other project that I don't have the time or the resources to devote to. So why even go there? I Let's focus on organizations or um, grants that can do what I'm wanting them to do. So five rules for writing fundable grant proposals. And again, I'm probably repeating myself because there's common themes here, but keep it clear and simple. You should be able to explain it very basically what you're looking to do. Um, use credible data. I love data to, and stats that back up um, my case for support. Using real life stories and examples. I mean, if I can get um, a client at CMHA to talk about our bereavement program in front of a potential funder, that's golden. We don't often have that opportunity, but I did have it happen where um, this um, family spoke in front of this gentleman who had a family foundation and he was gonna give 50,000 and because he heard the impact that that program made, he doubled it. So, I mean, that was, that was one of your best days in your fundraising career when that happens. Um, so, you know, that's, that's not the average, but even in your newsletter, highlight those stories. Do not make it about the organization needs. No, what it needs is what it does for that individual or what it does for the family or the impact on the environment or what it does for the community. It's not about you and it's not about your organization. It's what the end result is. Be specific. So if you're going to be wishy-washy, they see through that. So be concrete. And use language that the reviewer will understand. So particularly, I mean, if we were talking about uh, hospitals and, uh, and some fancy-dancy piece of equipment, you know, dumb it down so that anyone could understand what it is you're asking for and what you're saying. OK. So, you get the letter, you get the phone call, your proposal's accepted. You don't just go to cash the check and say, okay, that's it, I'm done with them, we're moving on. That's really just the beginning. Because you want to thank your funder, you want to confirm when you're going to receive the payments, what documentation they expect you to, um, to send to them. Often, um, increasingly, like I said earlier, accountability, transparency, they want reports. Um, on how the money was used. They want to see pictures. They want to see postings on social media and, you know, just showing their, their um, funding in action. And start planning um, for after the grant period. Like I said, how are you going to, you know, show them impact? How are you going to show the funds making a difference um, that you asked for? And again, if you get the letter saying thanks but no thanks, that's not the end of it either, or at least it shouldn't be. You still, I would still pick up the phone um, and thank them, ask them for feedback. I've done that before, like I said with Val. Um, you know, that was that was invaluable, and I, and I try to do that whenever it's possible because um, sometimes they'll say, you know what, it just wasn't a good fit. Uh, sometimes they'll say, you know what, this was good, we like this, but we need more of that, so relationships. Um, you know, if it was just something that needs to be tweaked or fine-tuned, ask if you know you can apply again. And um, ask them, you know, if you can stay in touch. If you think it's worthwhile, right? If it's clearly you want to do A and they're look, looking over here to do B, then yeah, I wouldn't necessarily waste your time. But if you think there's potential there, then I would keep in touch with them. All right, so know your database. Um, you know, using your key volunteers, your board of directors, whomever that can help leverage those relationships is really invaluable. And um, I think any organization I've been at could, has, has the, had the capacity to do a better job at that because you'd have a few key volunteers that were very keen, but sometimes people don't realize, um, you know, their neighbor could be invaluable to what you're, you're hoping to do. And how are you tracking, you know, like I said earlier, your data? Are you using an Excel spreadsheet? Do you have Razor's Edge, which is a more sophisticated fundraising software that does have 
um, money attached to it. But depending on the size of your organization, you should have some sort of tool that's tracking your regular attendees, you know, who's coming to your events, because your repeat customers are going to be your best prospects, inevitably. And maybe, you know, them personally may not know, may not be have the capacity to give you, you know, thousands of dollars. But, you know, get to know them. They might know people that can help you out, and they're obviously committed to your cause and your organization. And, you know, how are you communicating with them? Are you, you know, sending them newsletters? Are you showing them the difference you're making in the community? Um, you know, what's going on? Just regular engagement in some way, shape, or form. And, and uh, the frequency of communication, right? So you don't want to just be sending them um, appeal letters. You want to send them updates about, you know, we just launched this new exhibit and invite them to your special events. I always thought arts organizations had a real um, advantage for that because you guys are, you know, always doing, you know, showings or readings or, you know, a whole bunch of exciting things that, you know, people would like to, to be included in and it's always changing. And then further to, um, you know, thanking your donors, it's like stewardship and the recognition of gifts. And is there anything unique or different that you can do? And again, I think arts organizations could market a whole bunch of exciting opportunities. I was at the Toronto International Film Festival a few years ago, and you know, someone, a family foundation had named the box office, right? Like everything was named there. I know when I worked at the university in the Jackman Theater, um, they were replacing seats and they were selling seats at one time for $500 and you put your name on a seat. Like there's all these really unique different ways that you can recognize people, um, particularly at, uh, in arts organizations. And then reporting to your donors, like I said before, you know, transparency, accountability, and ongoing communication. And you know, sometimes if you have a larger campaign, you can lay it out like, if you give between, you know, zero to 100, you're going to be recognized at this level, or you'll receive, you know, this benefit or that benefit. So I just, well, I just thought um, there were some local examples that I thought of right off the top of my head that I knew had attracted grants that I thought had a good brand, like I know right away what they stand for and um, a little bit about them. So I mean, those to me, um, demonstrate that they're doing a good job of, you know, the average person knowing what they're doing and, um, and have been successful with, uh, with grants um, and also have signature events. So the Windsor Endowment for the Arts, the Film Festival has, you know, grown in leaps and bounds and I know that they've uh, received funding, uh, Bookfest Windsor, um, and then I also, you know, the Windsor Symphony Orchestra has done great things as well. And I mean, that's just a couple examples that when I was putting this together, I was uh, I'm thinking, and there's countless, countless others, but um, I, I think that the, the message to, to wrap this up is that there are lots of opportunities. Just know your stuff, be persistent, do your research, use your volunteers and the resources that you have um, available. And uh, inevitably, don't get discouraged. And, um, you know, I think there's room for all of us to be successful. And, and like I said, there's room to collaborate. Funders love that, too. Thank you, Kim, for, for your presentation here. Uh, I thought I would ask you a couple a couple more things to, to get a little bit more knowledge out of you while you're still okay. here. Um, first of all, do you have a common, like, what, what would you say is the biggest mistake that grant seekers make when looking looking for funding? I think not finding a match to, you know, what it is you're trying to fund and what the grantor is interested in. So I think, you know, you really need to do your homework and find out how it fits within their criteria, if it even does. Because I know I've made that mistake where I think, oh, this works. And if I really took a step back, it doesn't really. So don't force it. That's right. right, right. It's, it doesn't, yeah, it's not a match. Don't waste your time. Go looking for one that is a better suit to your organization. And and speaking of which, do you have any, is there anything that you wish you knew when you first got into the fundraising field? I think, yeah, just using the resources and the tools around you. So, um, you know, I talked about using volunteers or your board 
and um, you know, finding out who knows whom, especially for those local foundations, because like I said, Windsor isn't that big of a place, and uh, you know, there are a handful of, of foundations that are active, and you know, you could, you could have the opportunity to get in front of them or, or make a phone call, and, and they know the community. So I think, you know, spending more time on those, developing those local relationships, rather than, you know, applying to the, the huge foundations of the world that you just are competing against so many more organizations. Um, that would be, you know, what I, what I wish I had hmm. done more of. Could you speak more to that? Because you talked about there's the local and then maybe pr provincial, national, right. international. Yeah. And of course, on one hand, there's like more dollars, but more yeah. competition. That's right. And then smaller, maybe less, but more relationships. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about the strategies of like, is it good to always start small and when you know, like you, when you want to dream big? It depends on the scope of your, um, of your project or what it is you're hoping to accomplish. I mean, if you have something that's cutting edge and, and you know, it's going to change the world or, or really revolutionize something in your community, then certainly I would, you know, encourage looking to some of those foundations that do have the capacity to give you, you know, higher dollar amounts. Um, that's when I would reach out. Or if it was a, you know, if someone encouraged you, you know, said, you know, I heard about this foundation and I think this would be a really good fit um, in those instances. But, um, you know, I always like the smaller ones because I, I, I feel like I'm not going into a dark well, and you do get feedback, and uh, it's it's been more success. It's been a more successful strategy in my career. And do you have any stories that you like to tell about whether it's your specific example or other organizations that come to mind about funding and how maybe they tried it in a different way or, or that could some kind of lesson? I think you know the biggest thing is persistence and not getting um, discouraged by the nose because um, you're gonna get a lot of no's. There's a lot of you know, fundraising competition, but if you have a solid enough case and you're doing something that is gonna make an impact, is gonna make a difference, there are enough you know, funders out there that inevitably you, know, you can find something that is gonna be successful. Mm -hmm. And what is a bequest? I know, oh. <laughs> I recognize the word, but I feel like if I don't know, there must so, be someone else. So, um, it's, it's um, huge uh, p potential um, for fundraising. Um, are people leaving gifts as part of their estate? Yeah. So, you know, if you wanted to leave 1% to uh, the uh, Capitol Theater as part of your wink, estate, wink. Yeah. <laughs> then um, that's um, a bequest. And... Uh, they had talked a few years ago about this trillion dollar transfer of wealth that was going to happen because the baby boomers were, were getting to that age. So I don't know if that's going to happen, but it's certainly um, something to keep in mind when, um, when you're talking to your donors about um, you know, if they're interested in leaving a gift in their estate. Great. And could you speak at all to to metrics and maybe especially to arts organizations of how to think about me metrics and what to measure and outcomes and um, whether that's volunteers or attendance? Yeah, or I mean, I think attendance um, at the event's uh, growth. If you're seeing, you know, any growth, then that shows uh, impact. Um, how the community is um, has come on board and, you know, has there been any declarations in the city or... You know, is there are there any groups um, coming on board? Are you co collaborating with anyone? You know, are you invol involving schools? Is there an educational component? Um, you know, looking at all those kinds of, of metrics. It's not necessarily always the amount you're raising, but um, how you're making a difference. And I think how well how well you're spending the money too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like I said, accountability. I can't even stress like um, increasingly. You know, I've been at this. 15 years, and I see far people far more interested in how you're going to use their uh, donation dollars, right, even right. in that you know relatively short amount of time. And I think that's just going to increase.